delighted to be here to introduce Albie for I think the lecture that has the most intriguing title of his lecture series, Does the Law Have a Sense of Humor? And I have no idea what's coming next because I, can, I know lawyers with a sense of humor, I know laws that are jokes, but I don't know what it means to ask, does the law itself have a sense of humor? And I'm sure that Albie will enlighten us. Now I had intended to, to go through more of, more of Albie's career as a human rights activist. I think those of you um, who've come, you know, we have, we have many repeat offenders here this evening who've come and heard the wonderful lectures that have preceded this one. So I'm going to skip all of that and move only straight to 1990 for those of you who haven't perhaps been here and been more familiar um, with Justice Sachs' career. In 1990, after a quarter century almost in, in exile, Albie Sachs returned to South Africa and became a member, sorry, as a member of the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress, the ANC. He played a central role in the negotiations that led eventually to South Africa becoming a constitutional democracy. And after the first democratic election in 1994, President Nelson Mandela asked him to serve on South Africa's newly established constitutional court, a position from which he has only recently retired. Having retired from that court, he seems to have decided that the right thing to do is to abandon summer in South Africa. And I looked actually for the forecast for Cape Town this week. It's sunny and 78 degrees. <laughs> and spend the month of January in Chicago with us, teaching and lecturing in the snow and ice. And having said that, I realized that the word retired is absolutely ludicrous to apply to Albie Sachs, and that was the best uh, segue I could think of to move on to, does the law have a sense of humor? Thank you very much. I'll just wait a moment for some people to sit down. And then I understand we, we will end today. It's going to be quite pithy. I have a nice, neat presentation to make. Uh, I'm going to see the State of Union address. I guess a lot of you are. and. Um, just the soundings we made uh, were that we would end punctu punctually at, at 7.45. So I should speak for about 25 minutes. We'll have time for, for questions. Uh, and then, then we leave. I was in complete and total darkness. Hearing nothing, seeing nothing, unaware of myself or my existence. And a voice came through to me, Albi, this is Ivo Garrido, you're in the Maputo Central Hospital, your arm is in a lamentable condition. Uma condição lamentável in Portuguese. You have to face the future with courage. And into the darkness I said, what happened? And I heard a woman's voice say, it was a car bomb. I fainted back into the obscurity, but with a sense of elation. I knew I was safe. I'd had the feeling that something terrible had been happening to me and feared that I was being kidnapped and taken over the border of Mozambique to be locked up in South Africa. I knew I was safe. I feel light, happy. I'm aware of lying on a flat, hard bed with a sheet over me. My eyes are bandaged, so I can't see anything. 
And I told myself a joke. The joke, many of you might have heard it, is about Jaime Cohn, like me, a Jew. He falls off the bus, he gets up and he does this. And someone said, Jaime, I didn't know you were Catholic. What do you mean Catholic? Spectacles, testicles, wallet and watch. <laughs> and I'm feeling lightheaded. I started with the testicles. <laughs> I, who've tried without success all my life to be macho, got a huge reputation in the ANC camps. And the first thing Comrade Albie did was reach for his balls. <laughs> Everything in place. Wallet. I feel my heart. It seems that nothing serious has been destroyed there. My hand goes up to my skull. Is my head all right? Is there a big crater there? And it's tender, but it seems to be fairly intact. And then my hand slides down, and I discover the loss of my arm. And I feel joyous. I think every freedom fighter for years has this feeling, will they come for me today? And if they come for me, will I be brave? Will I get through? And now I knew they'd come for me, and they tried to kill me, and I'd got through. I felt elated. It was only an arm. And as I fainted back into my joy, I had a kind of a sensation which I wrote up in the book afterwards. I joke, therefore I am. <laughs> About three, four months later, I'm out of hospital, I'm very weak, and I hear the doorbell ring at the apartment where I'm staying. I slowly walk there and open the door. I'd heard that the ANC, the leadership, had sent two members of the National Executive to greet me on behalf of the NEC. And there I see John and Cuddy Meng, trade union leader who'd known my dad, had also been a trade union leader, the long, solemn face, and Jacob Zuma, who's now the president of South Africa, with a big, happy, warm smile. And I'm determined to get John and Cuddy Meng to smile. That sense of euphoria at having survived the bomb is still with me. We walk inside, we sit down, and I tell them the story, knowing that they're going to go back and report the story. And I take my time, and I describe those first moments when I don't know what's, literally what's hit me, the concussion, the feeling of being dragged, my shouting in Portuguese and English, leave me, leave me, I'd rather die here as I'm being pulled along but not shouting too loud because I am a lawyer in a public place. <laughs> and Kadi Meng has a long face, and Zuma is beginning to chortle and to chuckle, and he goes along African style, and I'm telling the story African style, you don't jump to the punchline quickly, you spin it out, with all the little nuances and the strangeness and quirks of human nature and you take your time and he's taking his time with the being jolly and supporting me in my storytelling and eventually when I come to the part of Jaime Cohen and spectacles, testicles, wallet and watch 
He bursts out laughing. He almost falls off the chair. He's enjoying it so much. But John and Cody Ming still kept his long face. And I might say that John had had a son blown up by a bomb. And again, when I came to write about it afterwards, and the thought came through so strongly to me at the time, was this would be how we would get the new South Africa. This was 1988. I had that strong feeling as I got better, my country would get better. There was no direct connection, but it was a total absolute conviction that I would learn to stand, to walk, to run, to tie a shoelace, to write, get stronger, and my country would recover and recuperate from the blows of apartheid and get stronger. And I said to myself at the time, this is how we'll get our new South Africa. My Jewish joke, mingling with Zuma's African sense of storytelling, style and humor. And we, when we get our new non-racial democracy, we will bring in what we've got, we'll come in as who we are. We won't homogenize ourselves to become a non-racial, non-person entity. We bring in our styles, our characteristics, our personalities, and our humor with us, and we share and we mingle. And that's how we'll get the new South Africa. That was in about May 1988. In, I guess it was about 2004, 2005, I'm Sachs J, Justice L.B. Sachs of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. And I'm one of 11 judges, and we're hearing the case called the Laugh It Off case. Uh, a graduate of the School of Journalism who'd read Naomi Klein decided that he would set up a company called Laugh It Off small company, and as his culture jamming project, he would manufacture t-shirts appropriating the logos of big corporate entities in South Africa and turning around their slogans to make some kind of humor humorous, sharp political point. Most of the companies found it rather amusing, and some of them actually bought up a large number of the t-shirts in that clever way of co-opting your critics and dish them out to their employees. But calling black label beer were not amused at all. Their, uh, Headquarters in the Netherlands insisted that calling black label in South Africa take action. The t-shirt which was distributed by means of the internet, which wasn't all that big in South Africa at the time, reaching people like Justin Nurse, the owner of Laugh It Off, it made maybe a couple of hundred of them. The t-shirt read, Calling Black Labor. <laughs> and instead of saying, America's lusty, lively beer, said something about South Africa's history of labor exploitation. It wasn't very refined or very witty. <laughs> the change from calling black label to calling black labor I think was a little bit amusing. The High Court said, thou shalt not use thy neighbor's logo to sell thy t-shirts <laughs> and prohibited, interdicted the sale and ordered Justin Nurse to pay the costs. He went on appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal 
they were also unamused. And they said there's nothing in terms of free speech in our country to stop you from criticizing the labor policy of calling black label or any enterprise in South Africa. But you can't use their own logo to sell your t-shirts. The matter came on appeal to our court. I remember that the counsel for Justin Nurse was his name, was terrified of getting into the realms of Naomi Klein. So he took the most technical uh, intellectual property law approach that he could. And he said there'd be no proof that the sales of the beer had been diminished. No proof of any patrimonial loss. And he wasn't passing off the t-shirt as beer, so it wasn't an appropriation in that sense to make it appear that people in buying their t-shirt would be getting the beer. And he said, therefore, the restraining order should be uplifted. The Deputy Chief Justice, Dikha Musameki, wrote a very elegant judgment, basically upholding that argument, but giving more weight to the freedom of speech dimension, and saying that what you put in the scales to see if it's fair use or not, what you put in the scales is the detriment, the patrimonial or material loss calling Black Label on the one side, and the free speech rights on the other. Eloquent, well-reasoned judgment with which I agreed completely. It didn't go far enough. It, to my mind, missed the point. There could even have been a certain loss in the sales of, of the beer. I mean, the beer was actually directed at African working class. America's lusty, lively beer, it makes you strong. The sexual innuendo was what it was really about. It's the same label that's used and the same logo in other parts of the world where they have other slogans completely. The taste is different in different parts of the world depending on what their marketing people have decided is the taste that goes down well. But that was the South African slogan. And what Lofford Off was really getting at was the power of the branders, the big commercial companies, to colonize the minds and the souls and the imaginations of the people. That was what it was all about. It wasn't to sell t-shirts simply by means of a lampoon. It was to go in for and he explained it to us, cultural jamming, where you, like jujitsu, you take the weight of your opponent to trip up your opponent. You use their very material to challenge what they're trying to do. I, in pre preparation, did a lot of reading up on parody. There's some beautiful sort of postmodern uh, intellectual writing on parody. But the whole point of parody is appropriation and dislocation. The viewer, the listener, has got to see or hear the object that's being parodied. That's the whole point of it. That's the source of the humor and the source of the point being made. And what he was doing was using parody to tell people in this world dominated by consumerism and the culture of consumerism to clear your brains, recover your independence. He gave the example of Nike shoes, running shoes. He said if it was advertising, you promote the product by saying it's made of sturdy material, 
You can run three times around the world, and if it's showing signs of disrepair, we will replace it. Or it's got a nice spring in it that gives you an edge over competitors in a race. Or it's waterproof. These are real qualities. But Nike doesn't say any of that. It just says, is it? let's do it. I get mixed up with, yes, you can. <laughs> it says, let's do it. It means you buy our shoes and you can do anything. And products these days are all promoted on that basis, that it will make you a kind of a super person. And that was the real point that he was making. And I felt that was the point that should be the heart of the, the response. I thought a little bit about the role of, of humor. Long, long, long time ago, I think the first book of Sigmund Freud I read was Wit and the Unconscious. And the role that wit plays in dealing with often very conflictual issues. And you allow the conflict to come out, but you do so in a way that's humorous, might be bitter humorous, it's humorous so that you're containing it while you are revealing it. It's a way of letting out these uh, deep uh, and, and challenging and at times what could be frightening and overwhelming unconscious uh, thoughts and urges. I thought of uh, Archbishop Tutu. You think my question is, is a provocative one. Tutu often says, he chooses his moments, he says, does God have a sense of humor? And he said, God has got a sense of humor. And everybody laughs. And they're laughing at the idea of imagining God laughing. And that's, in a way, what Tutu is doing. He is, if you like, bringing the sacred down to earth and humanizing a deep sense of spirituality. And he says, when you see what's happening in South Africa today, people who were trying to kill each other before are playing rugby on the rugby field, uh, doing all sorts of things together. You go and look at our new parliament, you'd say, God really has a sense of humor. Who could have imagined that President Thabo Mbeki would go to the funeral of P.W. Boerter, one of the last of the apartheid titans? So that's Tutu playing with the reverence that people have for the deity with a big smile on his face, making a point. I know that humor in court uh, is very strong, as Jane pointed out. Uh, I remember being in a crowded court in, in Cape Town once, at the Cape Town uh, High Court. My friend Lenny Hoffman, uh, Lord Hoffman of the top court in, in England, also recently, his term came to an end. I don't use the R word. His term came to an end. Uh, he came late to that court. It was a court that had lots of uh, formal matters, one after the other. And as he was joining us, uh, the judge said something, and 20 of us in court, we all roared with laughter. And Lenny roared with laughter, and then he said to me, what, was, what did he say? <laughs> You join in. When a judge laughs, you laugh. But it's partly that special laughter in a court that's tense. And again, it's breaking that, the formality that makes a rather feeble little aside from a judge appear to be absolutely uproarious. It's not just psychophancy. But my question was different. I enjoyed the idea of opening my judgment. Uh, we call our legal our decisions, we don't call them opinions, we call them judgments, with the question mark, the question, does the law have a sense of humor? And then dealing with the facts, the issue, 
and in a way that my colleague hadn't done in the main judgment for the court, covering the, the theme of challenging the hegemony, uh, the domination, the colonization, a new kind of imperialism of the brand makers and saying in these circumstances, even it's not the fact that there's no clipboard evidence to prove loss of sales on the part of the beer that makes the restraint inappropriate. It's the fact that the whole project was an intense exercise in freedom of speech. The whole point about it was to challenge the commercial speech and the emptiness and the falsity of it by means of a subversive speech. And the parody was the whole point, to draw attention to the branding and to try and subvert it, using its own force, its own weight, to trip it up. So the judgment I wrote then was in support of the main judgment. Uh, it went around the world. I suspect of all the judgments I've written, this was the one most read, because the property lawyers, intellectual property lawyers in all continents were terrified that capitalism would come tumbling down if this approach took hold. Well, capitalism nearly did come tumbling down, but I don't think it was my judgment that was responsible. So I'm just going to read the last portion of the judgment. The Constitution cannot oblige the doer to laugh. It can, however, prevent the cheerless from snuffing out the laughter of the blithe spirits amongst us. Indeed, if our society became completely solemn, because of the exercise of state power at the behest of the worthy, not only would all irreverent laughter be suppressed, but temperance considerations could end up placing beer drinking itself in jeopardy. <laughs> and I can see no reason in principle why a joke against the government can be tolerated, but one at the expense of what used to be called big business cannot. Laughter, too, has its context. It can be derisory and punitive, imposing indignity on the weak at the hands of the powerful. On the other hand, it can be consolatory, even subversive in the service of the marginalized social critics. What has been relevant in the present matter is that the context was one of laughter being used as a means of challenging economic power resisting ideological hegemony and advancing human dignity. We are not called upon to be arbiters of the taste displayed or judges of the humor offered. Nor are we required to say how successful Laugh It Off has been in hitting its parodic mark. Whatever our individual sensibilities or personal opinions about the t-shirts might be, we are obliged to interpret the law in a manner which protects the rights of bodies such as laugh it off to advance subversive humor. The protection must be there whether the humor is expressed by mimicry and drag or cartooning in the press or the production of lampoons on t-shirts. The fact that the comedian is paid and the newspaper and t-shirts are sold does not in itself convert the expression involved into a mere commodity. Nor does the fact that the parodists could have voiced their discontent by phoning into a talk show rather than employ the trademark remove their protection. They chose parody as a means and invited young acolytes to join their gadfly laughter. A society that takes itself too seriously risks bottling up its tensions 
and treating every example of irreverence as a threat to its existence. Humor is one of the great solvents of democracy. It permits the ambiguities and contradictions of public life to be articulated in nonviolent forms. It promotes diversity. It enables a multitude of discontents to be expressed in a myriad of spontaneous ways. It is an elixir of constitutional health. Thank you. So I believe you generally prefer to take several questions at once and answer them together, right? Right, okay. and we have six minutes. We have six minutes, so be, be brilliant and succinct. Sir. <clears throat> In a previous lecture, you alluded to uh, an encounter with members of the American Supreme Court. Was there any humor in that encounter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, plenty. And, and the most humorous, I would say, is Justice Scalia, uh, who just it boils over in him. And, and in his own way, he can be quite irreverent. Uh, he and I are poles apart in terms of judicial philosophy. But in terms of, of um, a sense of fun, I think we have a lot in common. Uh, we share initials and we share a sense of fun. As it happens, I've just heard today, I'm, I'll be having lunch with Stephen Breyer and um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Nino Scalia and um, Sonia Sotomayor uh, on tomorrow, two weeks. So I can do a laughter test, if you like, and see. <laughs> You don't see much humor in, in the judgments, in, in the opinions. Uh, it's as though to be a judge you've got to squeeze out any humor. But I did read a nice bit by, uh, by Scalia uh, where he had to deal with the constitutionality uh, of a law dealing with uh, the making of sausages, frankfurters. Uh, and he said Bismarck made a famous statement about um, uh, just as in the case of making sausages, it's better you don't know how laws are made. Uh, and he said, I can now deal with both of these in, in the one judgment. I think that's the only example I've come across in American decisions. Um, can you say something about the place of humor in judgments about things like torture? which obviously has been something that our country has been grappling with the legality of lately. I think there could be a kind of humor of discord, uh, a, a, a savage humor that's used to point out the, the uh, cruelty of torture and, and people who want to turn a blind eye to torture. So there's that kind of wit there can be a witty but a sarcastic uh, response. But certainly it would be completely inappropriate to make a light-hearted joke when you're dealing with something so tragic and, and so awful. And it's not often I, I got a chance. We're dealing with a T-shirt that's, that's, that's fun, that, that makes people smile. The court was crowded. The newspapers loved the story. So I grabbed that chance. You say in the law, what is the law? Uh, the law is a text. The law is a pronouncement by judicial officers. The law is the knock on the door of, of the police coming to search your home. Uh, the law is a whole combination of things. And the point I'm really getting at here is, again, it's an attack on pure formalism, on seeing the society as a desiccated society controlled by abstract rules. It's to humanize the project. 
uh, and, and to underline the importance of, of light and dark, of shade, of nuance, of diversity. Uh, and it's very important for the openness of a society. If the comedians go, uh, and we, we, have, we have lots to satirize in South Africa, sadly, but uh, we have great comedians. And uh, now what's interesting is they're coming from all population groups. Um, the nephew of my great friend Zabeda Jaffa studied medicine. Uh, he's a part-time doctor. He's a stand-up comedian, Riyad uh, Musa is his name. Uh, and he sometimes plays very strongly on being a Muslim. And he said he was flying in an aeroplane. Uh, he suddenly felt a great spiritual urge and he started uh, praying in, in Arabic. And lo and behold, everybody in the aeroplane started playing, <laughs> praying. And he... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's picking up on something that is sharp and painful in society, but pointing to the contradictions and the humor of it, and we certainly need that. Uh, right now, Jacob Zuma, the president, still has, he's not pursuing it now, but a, a million dollar claim against Zapiero, one of our great cartoonists, because of the way that Zapiero portrayed Zuma in one of the cartoons. I'm glad I'm not sitting on the bench if that case should ever reach us. Uh, I happen to be very close to both of them. And uh, the question is whether or not Sapiro went beyond the bounds in, in the particular portrayal uh, that, that, that beyond the bounds of free speech, and I would leave that to a court. Probably the case will be resolved out of court in, in one way and another. My well, this leads me to the question less about the humor of the law, but uh, should you protect humor and where is the limit? Uh, are there, you mentioned torture, I would imagine genocide, but what about kind of inter-ethnic? Uh, well, I, I, I took part in a debate in London um, on the satanic verses and the Danish cartoons. And uh, I said, I'm not going to give you an answer. Uh, I said, I'm going to be as I am when I'm starting on a case. Just the different factors and thoughts and impulses and judicial institution, intuitions that come, at, come to play. And uh, I said, my inclination is to say satanic verses is serious literature. It's a challenge from inside Islam. Uh, against a certain orthodoxy uh, and it should be treated on that basis and I mean there's no question the fatwa to kill is, is totally out of bounds but would there be any justification on imposing restrictions on that and the publication of that whereas most of the Danish cartoons were pretty feeble but the one that showed the head of the Prophet Allah uh, as a nuclear warhead uh, is, is so offensive it's so Islam you can't be more Islamophobic than that. It's almost declaring war on, on Islam uh, as, as a culture, as a philosophy, as a religion. And I said I could imagine that the law could impose restraints on that. And maybe the restraint is, isn't to send someone to prison, but to restrain the publication, to get the press to censor itself, to apologize. Uh, and then if there's a defiance of the restraint, of the civil restraint, then penal law possibly could, could operate. Uh, interestingly enough, the Muslim uh, professor who was on the platform with me said he found that the satanic verses, in fact, was more damaging because it was so clever, it was so intelligent, and to eroticize uh, in the way that he did, the Prophet Allah, was profoundly and deeply wounding, uh, even to people who would encourage uh, a, a debate about the meaning of Islam today. And I started to think if somebody uh, took the, the person of Jesus Christ uh, uh, and presented him in a very erotic way, 
uh, an insulting and derogatory way to say, well, what justify is this whole person? Um, I can't see that that could have been, would have been permitted in Denmark. And I know there was restraint in Austria, which was upheld by the, Constitution, the, the Court of Human Rights, uh, preventing something similar being done in relation to, to, to Jesus Christ. So that's why context becomes very, very important. My own intuition is that humor at the behest of the modern life, the oppressed, humor as consolation, humor challenging power, is much more easily justified and, and compatible with the society than humor used as a weapon to crush people who are already marginalized. Humor that tracks forms of deep, deep insult and, and genocide and homicide of people, certainly burning a cross outside a home of a black family, which was said by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, as I understand it, not to offend, um, to be protected by the First Amendment, that, that wasn't intended to be humorous, but it's an ex exercise of free speech in most parts of the world would, would be prohibited. Uh, so the fact that something is classed as funny, if it is racist or sexist or uh, homophobic in South Africa, um, uh, would, that would not be protected in terms of institutional values. But of course it depends. So it has to have a very wide margin of, of appreciation. The law should be very reluctant to intervene. But I think there are forms of speech, forms of human speech, and that can be respected. Well, I know that you want to see the President's address, I and I know that other people do, and maybe he can lift our spirits in this address. So thank you very much, Albie Sachs. <laughs>